Thank you for your patience and the big handoff. Uh, last week, uh, good morning again. My name is Paul. I'm one of the co-lead pastors. So good to be with you. Last week, Pastor Britta, my wife, she uh, got to use lists with you, and so I wanted to get in on the fun. And so I'm going to start by asking you to make a couple lists. Okay, so the first thing, if you have paper and pencil uh, or a pen, uh, if you have your order of service, go ahead and grab that. You can also put this in your phone. Uh, but the first list that I want you to do, and this is not uh, like a test, so don't worry. I'm not going to quiz you later. Uh, you don't need to have, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, but what I'm going to ask you to do is to make a list it, mentally on paper on your phone of the top like three to five priorities that you have. Okay, so make a mental list, write a note. The top could say priorities. What are the top three to five priorities that you have in life? So go ahead and just take a moment to write those down. Again, no wrong answers, no pressure. The first few things that come to mind. Looks like some of you are still working, so I'm gonna invite you to kind of still be thinking about those things. Again, it doesn't have to be a huge list, three to five. As you're uh, writing that list, I now want you uh, to start thinking we're gonna make a second list, okay? Um, you can still be kind of finishing up your priority list uh, or even just have like kind of a mental note of the things that you think about that are your priorities. Uh, either next to it or somewhere else on the page, somewhere else, I want you to list the top three to five ways uh, that you organize your life. And what I mean by that is like how you spend your time. It was helpful for me to think about and making this list and how I organize my life is how I organize my time. So what are the top three to five things that you do with your time, how you organize your life? Um, for some, it may be work. Um, for some, it may be um, gardening. What are the top like three to five things of how you organize your time? Okay, take a moment to write those things down. How do you organize your life? How do you organize your time? When I was in school, um, after you made a list, uh, I had a teacher that would say, wiggle your pen when you're done. Um, I kind of wiggle the end of it. So as you're getting close, if you want to just do a little bit of a wiggle, just so I know that most people are done, or your eyes, yeah, wiggle your phone, just so I have a sense. Okay, so we're, you know, maybe we're still kind of fleshing those out, but I'm seeing a fair number of people, okay? So you have this list, you have a list of three to five things are your top priorities, and a list of three to five things are kind of the top ways you organize your life. Now, uh, you may have read the writing on the wall, uh, but here's what my invitation is for you. If you look at the list of your top three to five priorities, how much does it match your list of how you spend your time? To your top three to five priorities, how much does it match how much you spend your time, how you organize your life? I hope that it is a pretty good congruent list, right? That if family is important as a top priority, that one of the top ways you organize your time is family time together. And I really hope that if uh, God is one of your top priorities, that you kind of devotions or uh, being in church or in, gathered in church community are one of your top ways you organize your time. But I know at least for me, this practice was quite convicting because I started to realize the things that I articulate as the top priorities in my life are not often mirrored, they're not often matched in the way that I organize my time. Right, the way that I organize my life is so much more kind of uh, from a worldly mindset. Right, like uh, so much of my time is spent at work. Now, it's hard, right, as work, I could be like, well, that's time with God, because I'm a pastor. But so much of my time is spent in the, the work of work, right, of, of uh, c being concerned about how is this gonna go, or how are we gonna organize this thing, or how is this gonna take this time? And so a lot of my mental energy, the way that I organize my time, is not matching the things that I identify as a priority. 
And I think so often what happens is we get kind of caught in this trap of, of what the world tells us is important, right? If you can achieve more, if you can get more, if you can be more effective, if you can get more things done, if your yard looks great, if your house looks nice, if you've got a, a bigger backyard, if you have more time to play with people and do all these things and all these expectations, then you will find happiness and then everything will just all make sense. Right? And it's, it's not uh, rocket science. We know, I mean, we have rocket scientists here, and they know it's not rocket science. Uh, it's not rocket science to know that these things, priorities and organizations, how we organize these times, this is a, kind of an obvious thing, right? But in practice, how often do the things we say that we prioritize, how often are we actually organizing a life around these things? Now, you see, Jesus, he was a master. He was a master at inviting people to see the world in a totally different way. And he was a master at inviting people to think about how are you prioritizing your life? And how are you organizing your life in such a way that matches these priorities? And specifically, what Pastor Britta talked about is he would talk about this in the context of the kingdom of God. Right? The kingdom of God is this radical different way of looking at the world. It's saying the world is organized and has a certain set of priorities. And the kingdom of God is going to be dramatically different than this. It's going to look totally different than this. And my invitation to you is in following God and following Jesus and following me. Jesus speaking, not me, but following Jesus. And Jesus says, in following me, I'm going to invite you to a radically different way of understanding the world of how you're gonna prioritize, of how you're gonna use your time, how you're gonna organize yourself in communities and in structures. This is an invitation to a radical different way of living. And in particular, again, as Pastor Britta alluded to, uh, Jesus invites us to realize that the fullness of life is not found in getting more stuff. The fullness of life is not found in getting to the top or becoming the most important person or having all the accolades or getting more things accomplished, but rather the fullness of life is found in actually serving each other. And that in the process of serving, our life feels more fulfilled. We feel the more fullness of life. Now, again, this might seem like a pretty basic thing, but I think it's really important for us if we're going to be talking about Christian service, evangelistic service, as Britta called it last week, if we're going to be talking about service, we have to get this in the right order. That we have to understand that if our priorities don't match how we organize our time with what we say, then, then all this will be is a shooting and odding all over the place with these, this Christian service, right? Uh, last week, she be, uh, Pastor Britta began uh, the first S in our BLESS acronym. And uh, we're in a series this summer called BLESS, which is an evangelistic uh, model for us. But really more, it's how are we sharing the love of Jesus with our neighbors? And this acronym stands for Begin With Prayer, Listen With Care, Eat Together, Serve In Love, and Share Your Story. And so last week, Pastor Britta talked about serving in love. And she talked about the idea that this has to really be rooted in our belovedness in God. And that from that place of being in love and knowing that we are loved by God, it's from that place that we serve. And she talked about the intersection of our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger and those things coming together. But you have to have that order correct, right? That you, this comes from a place of being loved by God. And so in a lot of ways, it would make more sense instead of serve and love, it probably should be in love, serve, right? To understand that as we serve, it's from a place of being loved. But not only does in love serve sound funny, uh, but it also makes a terrible acronym, right? Blice just doesn't have the same ring to it. You know, like I'm, I'm going to go blice the community. No, that doesn't work. So, but if it's helpful for us to think about the idea that we are beloved first, and it's from that place, how God has made us, that we serve. And so the same thing this morning, the passage we're going to look at is how Jesus invites us in the kingdom of God to think about how we prioritize our life, how we organize our life. And it's from that place then that the service of caring for others' needs kind of pours out naturally from who we're called to be. And so as we uh, kind of continue in this idea of service, of what it means to love and to care for our community, um, I'm going to, uh, we've done this practice before. Uh, sometimes in the church, uh, when you read from the Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, you stand. And so uh, as Pastor Scott often says, in, in, as you are able in spirit, stand, but as you're able in body, I'm going to invite us to stand together. And I'm going to have us read this passage. It's just four short verses. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 25. And the words will be on the screen. And so I'm just going to invite us to read this all together as a way of honoring uh, the word that God has given us. So let's begin. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. 
Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So this passage is one of this kind of reorienting a a new way of us to understand how we live life, a a brand new perspective on the kingdom of God. And the the kind of trajectory of this particular passage is Jesus is uh, with his 12 disciples and he's making this trek towards Jerusalem. Uh, And so uh, it's helpful to remember that the people of God, the, the Israelite people, they had these deep hopes and these deep desires for a Messiah. They had a longing for someone who would come and save them. And so as the 12 disciples are around Jesus, they start to realize, like, this is the guy that we have been longing for. He's going to restore us. He's going to fulfill all of the things that we've had these longings for. And I think sometimes when we think about uh, the people of God, the people of Israel, we forget kind of a really key component. And that is that the people of God are not people who are, like, elevated in social status. Right? The history and the legacy of the people of Israel is rooted in a story of enslavement. Right? These are people who have faced Egyptian captivity, and they've been oppressed, and they've been forced to do these things. And their social standing all along the course of history has been one of people oppressed. And so they have this longing for restoration. They have a longing for this freedom to experience this fullness of life, to experience what it's like to be in a place of power and authority. Right? And so even from the very beginning, when you hear that uh, Jesus talks about being a servant or being a slave, you can imagine how much this like, really rubs the, the disciples wrong. Right? Like, hold on a second. I have been waiting my whole life for something different, and now you're telling me I'm kind of back where we started? Kind of back in this place? Right? It's this off-putting kind of place because the people of God, they had these expectations. They had these expectations that as Jesus was moving towards Jerusalem, he was going to become the ruler. And he was going to sit on the throne, right? Jesus himself talks in kind of metaphorical ideas to the disciples about being the son of man, this person of highest authority, sitting on the throne. And he actually tells the 12 disciples, he says, you all will sit on seats with me. And as you're sitting on these seats with me, they make this uh, kind of inference, a natural one, that they're going to be in places of power. They get to be ones that are going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Now we're finally going to make it. We're on our way to Jerusalem, and we're going to be in a place of power. We're going to be in a place of authority. We're finally going to make it. Right? And so it's in this context that we kind of pick up our story as the disciples are moving with Jesus towards Jerusalem. They have all these hopes and these expectations for the kind of kingdom that God is going to invite, the kind of kingdom where they'll finally be on top. They'll finally get to experience the fullness of what life is like being in power and having all of the authority. And what's so interesting in this story is it says that uh, we hear uh, that there are two brothers, James and John. And they're coming to Jesus, kind of making this request. And uh, the James and John, they're oftentimes in the scriptures, they're called the sons of thunder, right? Because they're kind of these hot-headed guys, right? I don't think, uh, we don't know about their stature, but I imagine like their personalities are kind of that burly stature, you know, like, oh, we got this, like, oh, we're going to do this. We can make this happen, right? And I I love this about this story. And so they're like, okay, like we want to go ask Jesus about like, how are we going to be at the seats of honor on his right and his left? And so what do they do? They ask their mom to go talk to Jesus, right? Like, how great is that? Like, it's this great, like, certainly that was a more cultural thing. But in our context, it's just hilarious to think about, like, okay, we're going to do this. Mom, can you go talk to Jesus for us, please? Right? And so their mom goes and talks to Jesus and says, I want my sons to be on uh, your right and your left, like in these highest places of honor, sitting on these places of power and authority on these seats next to you. And Jesus says to James and John, he says, are you sure you can drink this cup? And they say, of course we can. Tell them, mom. Right? Like, they're just like, of course we can do this. We got this. And Jesus says, well, actually, you will drink this cup from me, but you don't have any idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what this context is like. And so then it says the rest of the 10 disciples, they get upset. They're frustrated that these two came and talked to Jesus. Now, they're not frustrated that they came and talked to Jesus because of, like, they're higher than that, sanctimonious, like, oh, I can't believe you'd ask that. More than likely, they're frustrated they didn't think of it first, right? They're like, oh, I wish my mom was here. 
right? Oh, they got in there first. They got to ask Jesus for these seats of honor. I just think it's hilarious that this is the context, but it makes sense, right? Because the people had these expectations. They had this legacy, this story of being enslaved and being oppressed. And they want to come into a place where they feel like they belong and they matter and they have place and purpose. And they finally get to be the ones in authority. And so Jesus has been telling them all along, right? Like the kingdom of God is not like this, you guys. The kingdom of God is a radically different way of understanding the world. He's going to clarify it again here, but like, come like little ones, come like children to me. This is what the kingdom of God is like, right? The last shall be first, the first shall be last. Remember, come on, guys, you got to get this. And so Jesus' 12 closest disciples, the people who had heard from Jesus over and over and over and over again about the kingdom of God being radically reorganized, I think it's important for us to take some time to think about how do we understand how we organize our life? How do we understand what we prioritize? Right, these 12 people heard it firsthand from Jesus. The kingdom of God isn't like that. And how often do we as, as individuals get kind of carried away by this idea of, of power structure, of seeking to kind of be in the place of power and authority? Of course, we have a longing for that, right? And so it's important for us that the 12 disciples are wrestling with this. We need to also, I think, be wrestling with this to help us kind of frame how are we prioritizing our life? How are we organizing our time? So it's in this place then that Jesus, uh, he says, you know how the Gentiles rule. And the Gentiles is actually better translated as like world leaders. So you know how worldly leaders operate, right? They lord it over people and they exercise authority over people. You know that's how world leaders work. Now, <clears throat> again, I'm gonna geek out. Uh, the two words that are talked about for lording over and of having kind of uh, exercising authority over, they both begin uh, with this Greek prefix called kata. And the Greek prefix kata has the word down. It means kind of to be down. So you can think about, like we often talk about the context of looking down on someone, but that doesn't kind of make sense in English to say that you're a down lorder. Uh, but so it's like they're, someone is up above, they're in a place of power, kind of at a hierarchical pyramid, and they are looking down, they're lording things over, down onto the people. And it says that they're then exercising their authority over or down onto the people. There's this very clear picture that Jesus is painting, is the way that the world is organized, the way that the world leaders operate in their leadership is a top-down structure, a pyramid. You get to the top, and then you tell people what to do. And so this first idea of, of downloading or lording things over people uh, is a really interesting word. Again, I'm going to be a geek. Come with me. So it, in the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and the New Testament is written in Greek. But there's a translation of the Old Testament in Greek called the Septuagint. And so it's a way in which they understood the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, in the language that they were more familiar with in Greek. And so sometimes it's helpful to kind of look at how are their parallels of how things are translated in the Old Testament to understand what they mean in the New Testament. So, lo and behold, this word is important for us today. <clears throat> this word that talks about lording things over in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is a word that's used in Genesis 1.28. And in Genesis 1, 28, God says, I have created humanity in my image. Male and female, I have created them to hold the fullness of humanity, bearing the image of God. And it says that I desire for humanity to subdue the earth, to subdue the, all the other created order, that the rest of creation is in the context that they would be stewards, that they would subdue the earth. And so the word that's used here for the world leaders of looking down on or lording things over is the same word in Genesis of to subdue the earth. Now, this was fascinating to me because I thought it helped paint a pretty clear picture of this kind of disordered relationship, right? That there's a, a disordered relationship in what's happening. Because this is a word that's talking about uh, the, the nature of humanity being kind of this set-apart thing, bearing the image of God. And the, the call then is for them to steward, to subdue the earth. But what's being talked about here is the world leaders, they are subduing the other people, right? They are dehumanizing those below them. It's like they're treating them like animals, Right? They're not even seeing the fullness of their humanity. They're lording things over them. They're looking down on them. They're oppressing them. And so this is what is being talked about when Jesus says they subdue people. They misorder their relationships. 
The way that they've organized their life has become distorted from the way that God originally intended in creation. And so these top leaders at the top of the pyramid are abusing the people below them, not even treating them like humans. And then it says that they are kind of exercising authority down onto them. And so we have this misordered relationship, and then you have these kind of self-serving priorities. Right, if they're exercising this authority over these people down onto these people, the point of how these worldly leaders approach things is they want people to serve them in their priority. Right, how can I get what they have for me? How can they carry out a task so I don't have to do that? How can I have more power and authority? How can I lord these things over them and have self-serving priorities that serve me, not caring for their needs? I think all of us, uh, unfortunately, have examples of leaders we know that are like this, right? Leaders that get to the top of an organization and feel like they've arrived. All of a sudden, now they get to make all the decisions and the demands, right? Thinking about how often businesses are organized and uh, CFOs and CEOs at the very, very top, and then everybody else's job is to carry out the desires and the needs of that key leader, right? That they get to exercise authority over people, telling people what to do and to come back and to serve them and their priority. I also think, unfortunately, we have far too many examples of this also being true in the church. Right? I have my own experiences with leaders in the church who were at a place that felt like, finally, I've arrived. And so instead of kind of modeling their life after what I think Jesus tells us is a radically different way of organizing our life, of prioritizing our life, these priorities are self-serving. And they lord it over people. Right? We, we are not immune to this kind of, of structure. We are not immune to this kind of power dynamic. And I think that is the invitation for us as a church community, as people who seek to follow Jesus together, is to wrestle with how are we keeping ourselves in check with that? How are we making sure that we're not seeking self-serving priorities, that my life would be prioritized by what can I get and how can I get more, and that we wouldn't be lording things over people, dehumanizing people in the process? I just want to name, uh, as one of your pastors, as co-lead pastors, Pastor Britta and I have no interest at all in that kind of leadership. And if you notice that publicly, I want to say, please hold us accountable. Please tell us if you are noticing ways in which we are having self-serving priorities or that we are lording things over you. That is not at all how we want to operate or how we want to function. Right? We want to model ourselves as a community that is seeking God together and that God is the one in charge. God is the one leading us and we seek to steward that place together. So please come and talk to us, truly. Please hold us accountable. So Jesus is explaining to the people, he says, this is uh, to the, his disciples, this is, you know, this is how the world operates. It's this pyramid structure, right? Top down leadership. And then he says this phrase that's repeated throughout the gospel of Matthew that should kind of cause ourselves to really listen and pay attention, could be a good mantra for us. And Jesus says, not so with you. Not so with you. Again and again in the Gospels, and specifically in Matthew, Jesus is telling the disciples, you know how the world operates. You know how the world is organized. Not so with you. The kingdom of God is so different than this. It's a radical repositioning. It's a radical reorganization. It's a radical way of prioritizing your life. And so then Jesus says, if you want to be great, if you want to experience greatness, which is this word megalos in Greek, I love that word megalos, uh, just like mega, right, fullness. The word, if you want to experience greatness, if you want to know what the fullness of life looks like, if you want to know what this actually is about, what true living is like, then you will become a servant. Right, that ordering your life, prioritizing your life in such a way as being a servant is what the fullness and the greatness of life is how you experience that reality. And the word that's used there for servant is this word diakonos. And it's the word where we get in English the word deacon. And deacon, uh, diakonos, is a word that means to meet the basic needs of other people. Right, diakonos service is to meet the basic needs of other people. Now I wanna be really careful because I think, unfortunately, we've done a disservice in the church on this. Uh, this is meeting the needs of other people, but not at the exclusion of meeting your own needs. Right? In love, serve. You have to remember the order and priority. 
I think sometimes we get caught, uh, it, right? It's, it's just so easy. Uh, like, I'm going to be the greatest at being the least, right? Like, we're still bringing that same, that same framework to the way that Jesus is showing us. Like, I'm going to be absolute best at doing the absolute worst of all the things, right? I'm just going to, like, grovel and whatever. And that's not really what Jesus is talking about here. What Jesus is talking about is meeting the basic needs of others. We have to also have our own needs met, right? Like we have to also be in a place of knowing our belovedness, of being cared for, of caring for our own needs that we can then meet the needs of other people. I just want to clarify that, right? It's, it's the centeredness together, the belovedness together. And so Jesus says, uh, you to be the greatest experience, the fullness of life, be a diaconos, a deacon. In the last two weeks, uh, we have had our deacons provide three, at least three different basic needs for our community. If you don't know, I think many of you in this room already know about this, but we are organized in our church in parishes, which is based around kind of our regions. So we call a parish like your neighborhood is your parish. And we have different leaders, deacons, who are responsible for that group of people in service and providing for basic needs. And so in the last two weeks, our deacons have organized meals for someone recovering from surgery. Our deacons have uh, organized a team of people to help another family move into the area. And our deacons have worked to find a bed for another person in recovery so that that person can kind of be in this home and be cared for by another group of people. This is profound. Right? Like I all of a sudden had, a, like I was so filled with pride and joy to be a part of a community that is actually seeking to meet the basic needs of each other. Right? But what's so beautiful about this is our deacons, they didn't kind of uh, forfeit their own needs. They didn't kind of grovel and become indentured servants, but rather they said, hey, we have this need, we have this place of help. Can you help us meet these basic needs? And I think this is what Jesus is calling us to, is the fullness of life says, as we serve other people, we are then served in the process. We experience the greatness, the fullness of life as people who are called to serve. Right? This is about, uh, from the worldly perspective, it's a misordered relationship. Right? Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What do you mean you're serving other people? And it's, a, it's a, a, a self-serving priority, not so much that it's serving yourself, but out of the selfness of who you are, you are then called to serve others as a priority. Right? It's a radically different way of understanding the world. So then Jesus goes on to say, if you want to be first, be a slave to other people. Now, I'll admit, that's kind of like a jarring statement, like, hold on a second, what does that mean? Uh, I want to unpack that a little bit. Uh, the word that's used there to talk about slave is this word doulos. And uh, doulos is a word that talks about someone uh, carrying out the, the will of their master. So it's answering the question, who's in charge? Right? And so what I, I think is a helpful image for us is what Jesus says is, if you want to be first, you are a slave for others is not, by the way, condoning slavery. But Jesus has just upended. Don't, don't lord things over people. Don't kind of look down on people. This is not how you're supposed to function. But what Jesus is saying is there's a radically different way to organize the world. So if we often look at things as a pyramid, getting to the top and looking down on people, that's the, how the world structures itself. What Jesus says is if you want to be first... If you want to lead in this, if you want to look like what life really looks like in the fullness, you serve other people. And to be first is to, be in, to totally change the hierarchy. It isn't about a hierarchy, getting to the top. It's where you are. You lead in this by realizing that you're working together for a different master. Right? The context is not, okay, if I can get to the top of this a hierarchy, then all of a sudden I can have all the power and the control and the authority, but rather the whole way that we organize ourselves is to say, how are we serving other people? And how are we organizing ourselves, recognizing that we all follow a different master? Right? We all follow a, a God who is the one who is in control, who has the power. And our job is to come alongside with God and care for the needs of other people. And so then Jesus says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And the son of man is a, 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 a title that Matthew uses for Jesus that talks about the highest place of authority, right? If anybody has any place of authority, it's the son of man, who is Jesus. And Jesus models for us not to be served, but to serve. And then it says that he gave his life as a ransom for many, and the word that's used there for ransom is a word that describes uh, paying the debt of someone who is enslaved. 
And so when it says that Jesus has paid the debt, he has freed the people from enslavement, right? And so this is where we get the, the understanding of our theology that it is through Jesus that we have been freed from the bondage of sin, right? That it is through Jesus that we are invited into a radically new way of living and a new way of life. This is a powerful image for us. But I think there's even more of a one-to-one -one correlation here. And that is that in Jesus freeing them from captivity, it is freeing them from these kinds of systems and structures that oppress and oppose people, that other people and look down on them. Jesus is saying, I have come to free you from that way of organizing yourself. You are called to serve one another. This, this life is so different than you expected. It's not about getting to the top. It's not about having the power and authority, but in those places of power and authority that you find yourself, how are you serving others? How are you caring for the needs of other people? Yes, it can absolutely be a, a 360 turnaround in your life, and God may invite you uh, to lay everything down and do a dramatically different way of living. And I think that God's invitation for us is how are we prioritizing our life? How are we organizing our life so that in every day, how we interact with the world is affected? Right? That we would realize that we can serve others in our everyday interactions. That wherever we are, if we're in a place of power and privilege in a, in a work environment or a, a place of, of society, how are we using that place to serve others? How are we caring for the needs of our neighbors? How are we meeting what they are asking for at their basic needs? Not at the, the a banishment of our own self or our love, but being beloved. And from that place of being beloved, showing the belovedness of God to others. This is the invitation for us to understand our organization and our priorities. This is for how we're going to understand that the kingdom of God is radically reorganized. It's in this brand new way of seeing life to serve and love and meet others in love, serve. And in the process, we might blice some people and we might be blessed in the process. Right, that our call is to serve people. And from that place, from our belovedness, we would experience the greatness, the fullness of life. And so as we move uh, to the communion table, I wanna invite you to go back to your list and to look at your list of the things that you talked about as your top three to five priorities and to look at the ways in which you've organized your life, the top three or five ways that you've organized your life. And in light of just thinking about the excuse me, the way in which Jesus invites us to a radically different way of viewing the world, is there an invitation for you from this list? Is there something you're being invited to, perhaps to understand your priority differently? Right? I know for me, as I was looking at this list, I started to realize, like, okay, so one of my priorities is family, uh, but a lot of the ways that I organize my time is work. Some of that is, like, essential. Like, I can't not work. It's just, I mean, you could, but that doesn't really work, Right? But I started to realize that a lot of what happens and how I organize my time is that even when I'm at home, I'm thinking about work. And so if I've thought about prioritizing my life in such a way that my family is important to me, when I'm at home, I should prioritize my family, right? If I'm gonna interact with our kids as we're getting ready for church this morning, I, like I was all of a sudden like, oh my goodness, how are we gonna do this with three kids to get here at church? And I've got the sermon to prepare and all these kinds of things. And recognizing the invitation what if I, instead of kind of being obsessed about work, I can prioritize my family while I'm with them, right? What kinds of ways are you being invited to think about even how you interact with the world? About instead of someone making a request to you, could you help me with this thing? What's the invitation for us? How can we extend help? How can we serve others? Perhaps there's even an invitation for you to ask, do I need to reorganize my time? Are there other ways I need to reorganize my life so that it falls more in line with the things that I... I value the things that I call my priorities. And this is the radical invitation of the kingdom of God is to see that it's not a hierarchical top-down model, but rather that we are all seeking to serve God together in the context of community. And that's what we do as we come to this table. We come recognizing we are all seeking to, to follow the master God, to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to a world that is dramatically different, that isn't overthrowing the throne, but rather that the throne is this totally different thing of serving, not being served. And so as we prepare our hearts to come to the table, would you go to God with me in prayer?